In this video, which is part of my How to Mix series, I'm going to show you how to EQ. EQ is one of the three fundamental tools used to shape the mix. It's one of the single most important mixing tools available to you. If this is your first time here, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification icon to make sure you don't miss anything. As a beginner, one of the first mixing-related obstacles you're going to encounter will be something called mud in the mix. A muddy mix is a mix where the sounds don't sound crisp or clear. The key to a crisp, clear, and good-sounding mix is good mixing. And the most important tool when it comes to mixing is EQ. I'll show you exactly how to use an EQ to get the best results shortly, but before I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about why you should use it. You see, in order to learn how to EQ, you must first understand why. Here's an example. This project has been mixed in such a way that all the elements sit well together in the mix, despite the fact that there's a lot going on. Now, watch what happens when I remove all the EQing. As you can hear, it now sounds rather muddy. The low end is sluggish, and you can't really hear every element clearly anymore. As I said in my Mixing and Mastering Explained tutorial, the key to a clean mix is to make sure that each element has its own place in the mix. If you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend you go check it out when you're done watching this one. You can find the link in the description below. The key to a good sounding mix is clever EQ. The first step to understanding the mixing process is to understand how frequencies work and how they build up and overlap. A sound will typically sound great on its own, even without any EQing. But it will sound very different in the mix because all the sounds in a mix will affect each other. Often, you will only be able to hear some part of the sound clearly, while other parts seem to disappear altogether. This is where EQing comes in. You should use an EQ to make sure that there's enough space for each individual element in your mix. If done right, this will tighten up the mix and make all elements stand out. It will sound crisp and clear. I'll get to the actual EQing momentarily, but first, take a look at this frequency spectrum. Here, you can see I've divided the spectrum into sections. Before you start EQing, try to determine what kind of sound you're dealing with. Is it a bass sound? Is it a mid-range sound? Is it a high-end sound? In what box should you place this sound? Determine what kind of sound it is and where it should sit in the spectrum and EQ it based on that. If it's a mid-range sound, then you can safely shave off some of the low and high end. If it's an open or closed hat, then it's clearly a high end sound and you can therefore safely remove all the bass and so on.
When EQing, the first step is to make each of the elements sound good in isolation. That might mean subtly boosting the upper mid-range of a vocal to increase presence, or the low end of a synth part to give it more weight. The second, and arguably even more important for EQ, is to make space for all the elements to fit together. If multiple elements of a mix occupy similar frequency ranges and attempt to fit in the same space, the result will often sound muddy, muddled, and unclear. Here, I have a sample project. I've removed all the EQing, and now I'm going to show you how to EQ a few of the basic elements in this mix. The kick and the bass are extremely important. You want to reserve the low end area for these elements so that they can provide the most impact. Let's start with the kick. The main impact of the kick will usually be somewhere between 30 and 80 hertz. So I'm going to make a slight boost here. Keep in mind that most speakers can't reproduce anything below 50 hertz. Power systems at clubs and festivals go as low as 20 hertz, but you won't be able to hear these super low frequencies. You will, however, be able to feel them so you need to leave some of the ultra-low frequencies there. Most producers tend to roll a mix off at 20 to 30 hertz. The way you EQ various elements will depend greatly on the genre as well. For example, a big room kick will require a vastly different EQ than a tropical house kick. In this example, I'm just aiming for the maximum impact. Let's continue. There's usually a nasty resonance frequency somewhere around the 200 Hz area, and I like to take that out in order to make the lower frequencies have more impact and sound warmer. If you want, you can lower the mid frequencies a tiny bit to make more room for your mid range elements. This is where your main leads, vocals, etc. will be sitting. Depending on the kick, you can raise the high frequencies a little to make the attack of the kick come through more. Again, this will depend on the sample itself and the genre. Next, we have the sub bass. It can be difficult to glue the sub bass and the kick together. In order to do that, there's a few techniques available, which I will be talking more about in one of the next videos in this How to Mix series. But let's focus on the EQing for now. The main area of the sub bass is below 200 Hz. The bass is the most demanding element to reproduce for any speaker. So you have to be careful. As you can see, there's quite a lot of mid and high frequencies in this bass. This will steal room from our leads, vocals, etc., and we don't want that. So let's just remove all those frequencies. You don't need those. Where you cut will depend on the sound itself, and also if you've layered other sounds to work as a whole. If it's just one single bass sound playing, you may consider leaving most of the frequencies in there. Next, let's find one of the leads. As you can see, there's quite a lot of low end in here. This will interfere with our bass. Because the low end is so problematic, I recommend that you remove the low end from anything that's not intended to be a bass sound. I usually roll it off at 2 to 300 hertz. Just like the low end, the high end should be reserved for your percussion elements like hi-hats and such. You can safely cut the leads at 14 to 16,000 hertz to make room for the high end to cut through. To do this, Make a high cut and then slowly start cutting. Cut until you can hear the sound starting to change. Then ease it back a little bit. This is a good rule of thumb for all EQing. It's more important to make room in the mix so that every element has their reserved spot. 
Lead instruments require different EQing depending on what kind of sound it is. Sometimes I boost the low mids around 800 to 1000 Hz to give it more depth. If a sound is lacking brightness, you can use a high shelf and boost from 4000 Hz, but not too much. If you need to boost a sound by more than 6 dB in order for it to sound good, then that usually means that it's the wrong sound for the job, and that you should probably try using a different sound instead. You should always aim to use EQ very conservatively. Try to avoid massive boosts. I typically only boost a few decibels at the most. Try to cut out unwanted frequencies rather than boosting the ones you like. Cuts will sound much more pleasant to the human ear than boosts. If a frequency does not come through clear in the mix, it is likely that something else is occupying that exact same frequency range, and you should consider finding that element and cutting it at that frequency in order to let the other through, especially if it's a lead, vocal, or any other important element. Those really need to be up front, crisp, and clear. If your main leads consist of several sounds that have been layered, you might want to hear the low mids from one of them, and the high mids from another, and then the high sizzle from the third. In that case, you should use an EQ in such a way that every lead has room to cut through where you want them. Roll off everything but the highs from the lead you want the highs to cut through, and roll off the bass from the ones where you want the lows and mids to cut through, and so on. If you boost one, then cut the others at the same place. It's all about creating space in the mix for every single element to cut through. This is how you make a sound appear massive. Last but not least, let's focus on the high end. Here we have some crashes, open and closed hats. These sounds should be reserved for the high end. You can boost them ever so slightly, but not too much. Be careful when boosting the highs. It will tend to build up, and super high frequencies are not very pleasant to listen to. You can safely remove anything below 500 hertz or so. That's where the bass is, and you don't want anything to cause interference down there, especially not a sound that's sitting in the complete opposite end of the frequency spectrum. Every sound has some low rumble in it, even crashes and open hats, and we don't want that. So make sure to always low cut everything that's not a bass sound. This was a basic introduction to EQing. I could go on for hours explaining how to EQ various things, how to deal with all kinds of resonance frequencies, and so on. Unfortunately, this is something that is very difficult to teach because it will never be the same every time. It all depends on the sound and the mix and what's in it. 
This is what dictates how you EQ. It's something that has to be learned through trial and error, and therefore it will naturally take some time to become good at it. If you follow these guidelines, though, it should take you far less time to master the art of EQing. Most beginners tend to do it fundamentally wrong for a long time before they even learn the basics. Now you should at least be able to shave some time off your learning curve. I know this may seem a bit overwhelming and intimidating at first, but it will make perfect sense eventually. It takes a lot of time and effort to get good at producing, but don't give up. Keep at it. If you persist and never give up, you'll get there eventually, as with all things in life. Feel free to hit that like button if you found this video helpful. Make sure to check out the other How to Mix videos as well. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. I try to answer everyone. You can also follow me on Facebook and other social media as well. The links are in the description below. I hope this was helpful. You can help me make more videos like this by supporting me on Patreon. Any contribution will be much appreciated. You can find the link in the description below. That's it! I'm uploading new tutorials and templates every week, so make sure to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss out. Is there any specific tutorial you'd like me to make? Or perhaps you have a question? Just leave me a comment below.